John chapter 5, verses 24 through 47. Verses 24 through 27. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Burkett notes, Here we have a fifth evidence of Christ's Godhead and equality with the Father, namely that he is the author of spiritual and eternal life to all that believe on him. He hath a fountain of life equal with the Father, and communicated to him from the Father. He that hath a fountain of life equal with the Father, and communicated to him from the Father, is God. But Christ hath this, verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Again, he that hath authority to execute judgment upon angels and men is God, and Christ has such authority, verse 27. He hath given him authority to execute judgment. Farther, he that with his voice quicken and maketh them alive that hear it is God. And Christ doth this, verse 25, The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and live. The dead, that is, one, the spiritually dead, such as are dead in trespasses and sins, these, hearing the voice of Christ in the ministry of the word, shall live a life of grace on earth and a life of glory in heaven. Two, such as are corporally dead also. These are likewise quickened and raised by Christ as God. Learn hence, one, that God the Father hath communicated to Christ his Son a power to quicken and enliven such as are spiritually and corporally dead. Two, that the Father's communicating this power to the Son argues no inequality or inferiority in the Son, but he hath the same life infinitely, independently, and equally with the Father. As the Father hath it, so hath the Son. The Father hath it in himself, and so hath the Son also. Therefore, the Son as well as the Father is essentially and truly God. 3. Others, by the dead, understand those whom Christ raised from the dead, when he himself arose, when many of the bodies of the saints arose with him. Matthew 27, it being said, The hour is now, etc. Dr. Whitby. Verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Burkett notes, Our Savior, finding the Jews amazed and astonished at his declaring his sovereign and supreme authority and power to quicken and raise those whom he pleased from the dead, doth in these verses assure them, that there should be a general resurrection and a universal day of judgment, both of the righteous and the wicked, and a future distribution of rewards and punishments in another life, according to men's actions here in this life. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Observe 1. The certainty and universality of the resurrection of the dead declared. The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall come forth. Observe, too, the powerful and efficacious means by which this great and sudden change shall be effected and accomplished in the morning of the resurrection, namely, the omnipotent voice of Christ. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. 3. Here are the different ends of the resurrection declared, according to the differences of the persons which shall then be raised, good and bad, those that have done good to the resurrection of life those that have done evil, to the resurrection of damnation. Learn, one, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of the body. Two, that all in the grave shall be raised, though not all alike. The wicked shall be raised by the power of Christ as their judge. The righteous shall be raised by virtue of their union with Christ as their head. Three, according as men live in this world and go out of it, so will they be found at the resurrection, without any change of their state. There will then be only two sorts of persons, good and bad. All that have done good, however small soever the degree of their goodness have been, shall be rewarded. 
and all that have done evil shall be everlastingly punished. For all persons shall be eternally happy or intolerably miserable in the other world, according as they manage their deportment and behavior in this life. They that have done good shall go, etc. Verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Burkett notes, Here Christ declares to the Jews, and in them to all mankind, that they might assure themselves his judgment would be exactly righteous, because he had no private will or power of his own, contrary to or different from his Father. Learn hence that the Lord Jesus Christ, being the same in essence and nature, in power and operation with the Father, had no private will or interest of his own, but acted all things as God, in coordination with the Father, and as a man, in subordination to him. I can of my own self do nothing. That is, neither as God nor as mediator. Not as God, for God the Father and Christ being one, equal in power, what one person did, the other doth not as a mediator, for so Christ finished the work which his Father gave him to do, the will of the Father and the will of Christ being both one. As Christ was sent by his Father's order, so he was altogether guided by his Father's will, wherewith his own exactly concurred. Verses 31 and 32. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Burkett notes, Our blessed Savior, having produced these five foregoing arguments to prove his unity in essence and his equality in power with the Father, comes now to the end of the chapter to produce several testimonies for the proof of it, and the first of them is the testimony of God his Father. There is another that bear witness of me whose witness is true. Now the Father had lately come at Christ's baptism, by a voice from heaven, declared him to be his beloved Son, in whom he was well pleased. Which illustrious testimony, given to Christ, they had not regarded. Learn hence, that as Christ came into the world in obedience to his Father, and to bear witness to him, so did the Father honor him, and bear witness of him, and his testimony concerning his Son is undoubtedly true, and to be depended and rested upon. For we make the Father a liar if we do not depend upon the record which he hath given of his Son. Verses 33 and 34. He sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. Burkett notes, the second testimony to prove Christ to be the Messiah was that of John the Baptist. We read John 1, 19, how the Jews sent to inquire of him whether he were the Christ or not. And he denied it and pointed at Jesus, saying, Behold the Lamb of God. Yet would not the Jews abide by this testimony of John concerning the Messiah. Nevertheless, says Christ, I receive not testimony from John. That is, John by his testimony added nothing to me. I was what I was, and I am what I am, before John testified of me and since. Learn hence, that the divinity of Christ's person and the verity of his doctrine needs no man's testimony for the confirmation of it, being sufficiently confirmed by Christ's own authority and his Father's testimony. I receive not testimony from man. That is, I need it not. I desire it not upon my own account, but upon yours only, that upon the credit of John's testimony ye might believe in me and be saved by me. These things I say that ye might be saved. Verse 35. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Burkett notes, observe here John's character and the people's carriage. 1. John's character. He was a light, a burning and a shining light. He had in him a light of knowledge to enlighten, direct, and comfort others. And his knowledge was accompanied with zeal. He was a burning light in his doctrine and a shining lamp in his conversation. He had the light of knowledge in his head, the warmth of zeal in his heart, and the influence of both in his life. Learn hence, 1. That those whom God calls to the office and work of the ministry, he furnishes with abilities and endowments suitable to their great employments. He endows them with a light of knowledge, 
which is animated by the heat and warmth of zeal. Two, the ministerial gifts and abilities are not bestowed alike upon all, but dispensed variously. All are lights according to their measure, but all are not equally burning and shining lights for portion and degree. Three, that the brightest burning and clearest shining lights in the Church of Christ have but their time in this world. They are subject, as well as other men, to the common condition of mortality, and the lamps of their lives burn out faster by lighting others to heaven. John was a burning and a shining light, but now is put out and gone. Observe, too, as John's character, so the people's carriage. You were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Here is a threefold graduation. They rejoiced, they rejoiced in his light, and they rejoiced for a season. One, they rejoiced. The word signifies they leapt for joy and danced about him as children do about a bonfire when he first began his ministry among them. Oh, how warm are the affections of a people when a pious and zealous minister comes first among them. Two, they rejoiced in his light, not in his heat. Or, they rejoiced in John's light, not in Christ's. For when they found that John bare record to Christ, they soon grew cold in their affections towards John. Three, they rejoiced only for a season, for an hour, as the word signifies. For a short time, John's ministry was acceptable. Learn hence, one, that it has been an old practice among professors not to like their pastors long, though they have been never such burning and shining lights. John was not changed, but his hearers were changed. He did burn and shine in the candlestick of the church with equal zeal and luster to the last, but they had changed their thoughts of him and lost their esteem for him. Learn, too, that as nothing in general is so mutable as the mind of man, so nothing in particular is so variable as the affections and opinions of people towards their ministers. The lamp of John's ministry was always alike, burning and shining. His oil did not waste, but his hearer's zeal wasted, and their affections cooled. Those whose gifts are not at all abated may yet find a great abatement in the acceptation of their gifts. Therefore, let no man live upon the breath of men. Least of all, let ministers live upon the popular air or the speech of the people. Oh, let us live upon the credit which we have with God, and rejoice chiefly in his esteem. If our performances find acceptance with God, we are safe and happy, though they fall under contempt with men. Verse 36 But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works that the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. Burkett notes, The third testimony produced by Christ to evidence and prove himself to be the promised Messiah and Savior of the world is that of his miracles, which by an omnipotent power as God he was enabled to work. Christ's miracles were speaking testimonies of his unity with the Father and the divinity of his person. Not so the miracles of his apostles, for he wrought his miracles in his own name and by his own power and authority. But his apostles expressly declared the contrary. Acts three twelve and 16. Why look ye steadfastly on us as if we by our own power had made this man whole? His name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. Learn hence that the testimony of Christ's own works his miracles wrought in his own name and by his own authority and power, is a clearer confirmation of his Godhead, office, and doctrine than the best of men's testimonies. Yea, than John Baptist's own testimony that he saw the Spirit descending on him. Verses 37 and 38. And the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. He have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Burkett notes, Here our blessed Savior produces again the testimony of his Father, that he was the true and promised Messiah. This was given him both at his baptism and his transfiguration. When God the Father owned Christ to be his Son, by an audible voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased which testimony the Jews now ought to the more have regarded, because, though their forefathers had heard the voice of God at certain times, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 4, yet they in their times had never heard his voice. Learn hence 
that the Father's immediate testimony of Christ from heaven is greater than all the testimony given to him here on earth, greater than John's, greater than his miracles. The presence of the glorious Trinity, when that testimony was given, Matthew 3, ultimate, made that witness most awful and solemn. Verse 39. Search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Burkett notes the next testimony which Christ appeals to is the testimony of the scriptures, that is, the writing of Moses and the prophets, which Christ bids the Jews diligently search, and they shall find that they abundantly testify of him, and that all the prophecies and types were fulfilled in him. The word search, signifying to search as men do for a golden mine in the bowels of the earth, which they must dig deep for before they can come at. It intimates, one, that there is an inestimable treasure lying hid in the Holy Scriptures, which we shall never fathom by a slight superficial search. Two, that this inestimable treasure may be found out by the painful searcher, and it is the duty of all members of the visible Church to read and search the Scriptures, which point the way to eternal life. Verse 40. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Burkett notes, Here our Savior abrades the Jews for their obstinate infidelity, notwithstanding God the Father by a voice from heaven and John the Baptist by his testimony on earth, notwithstanding all the miracles which they had seen wrought by Christ himself, and notwithstanding the scriptures which they had pretended so highly to esteem of, did prove him to be the Messiah and the author of eternal life which they professed to seek. Yet such was their obstinacy that they would not come unto him nor believe in him. Ye will not come unto me, that you may have life. Hence observe, one, a choice and invaluable mercy, which Christ stands ready to bestow upon poor sinners, and that is life, both spiritual and eternal, a life of grace in order to a life of glory. Observe, two, the gracious condition upon which this invaluable blessing may be had, and that is, upon coming to Christ, believing on him and receiving of him. Three, Here is the true reason declared why sinners do miss of life and salvation by Jesus Christ when he had so dearly purchased it for them and does so freely tender it unto them, and that lies in their own willfulness and obstinacy. Ye will not come unto me. Learn hence that the true reason why so many sinners miss of salvation and eternal life after all that Christ has done and suffered for them is their own obstinacy and unwillingness to come to him that they may have life. Man, by nature, has not only an inability, but a fixed enmity in his will against Jesus Christ. Verses 41 through 43. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Burkett notes, observe here, one. How little our Savior sought the approbation and vainglorious estimation of men. I receive not honor from men. The same should all his disciples and followers do. Rest satisfied in the secret testimony and silent applause of their own consciences, without pumping for popular applause. Observe, too, the dreadful sin which Christ charged upon the Jews as the cause why they rejected him. I know that ye have not the love of God in you. O oh, deplorable state and case to be void of all true love to God, love being the spring of all action and the root of all true obedience. He that loves God will not only sweat at his work, but will bleed at his work too, if his work cannot be carried on without bleeding. But where love of God is wanting and no care to please God is found, his authority is despised, his son rejected, as the Jews here would not come to Christ that they might have life because they had not love of God in them. Observe 3. The high affront which these Jews offered to the Son of God in preferring any seducers or impostors before him, who came in their own names, whilst he was rejected, who came in the name of his Father. Learn hence, that though Christ was the great ambassador of his Father, not a servant but a son, and had his mission, his approbation, and his testimony from heaven, Yet so far did the perverseness and prejudices of the Jews prevail that he was rejected, while impostors and deceivers 
false Christs and antichrists without any evidence and authority from God because promising them a temporal kingdom were embraced and entertained. I come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. But if another, a seducer, should come in his own name, him ye will receive. As if Christ had said, You are incredulous to none but me. Every deceiver, every cheat, that hath but wit or wickedness enough to tell you the Lord hath sent him, is believed by you. But though I come in my Father's name, showing a commission signed and sealed by him, and doing those works that none but a God can do, ye receive me not. O oh, unreasonable infidelity! Verse 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Burkett notes, Here Christ tells the Jews that it's impossible that they should believe aright in him, because they were so in love with the praise of men, that they would own him for Messiah who could promise them a temporal kingdom, and in the meantime reject himself, who came authorized with the testimony and approbation of God. You will receive honor one of another, but reject the honor that cometh from God only. Learn that such as ambitiously hunt after vainglory and respect from men do evidence themselves to be regardless of God's approbation and acceptation. Verses 45 through 47. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father, there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Burkett notes, Think not that I will accuse you, that is, that I only will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses. That is, the writings of Moses, which you pretend to depend upon and to trust. For had you believed his writings, that is, the prophecies and types contained in his writing, you would have been led by them to believe in me, for they all pointed at me and received their accomplishment in me. But if Moses cannot be heard by you, I must expect no authority with you. Learn one that the whole scope of Moses' ceremonial law was to point out and prefigure Jesus Christ. Christ was the sum of the law as well as the substance of the gospel. He was Abraham's promised seed, Moses' great prophet, Jacob's Shiloh, Isaiah's Emmanuel, Daniel's Holy One, Zechariah's Branch, and Malachi's Angel. Two, that such as believed the ancient prophecies before Christ came did see their accomplishment in him when he was come. <laughs>